Super Mario, an iconic video game series beloved by children and man children across the globe. Now this being a series marketed towards kids, of course means that Mario games are going to be family friendly and full of happy-go-lucky levels and characters. But every now and again, Mario likes to dip his toes into the darker side of gaming. When I say dark, I don't mean scary. It's important to make a distinction between dark and scary. There are a lot of scary moments in Mario games. Just look at Luigi's Mansion. Things like ghosts, haunted houses, this monstrosity. These things are scary, but there's more to darkness than just being scary. Darkness goes under the surface and really makes you think. It's like the Drifloon Pokemon. You look at it and think, Aw, what a cute little ghost. I'm so scared. Then you read its Pokedex entry, and you can't look at it the same ever again. Little details like this are what helps make things dark. So what about Mario games is dark? Well, there are a whole bunch of moments throughout the series, like when Mario gets his body and his friends stolen by an evil shapeshifter, or when he literally dies and goes to hell. But in terms of a game being consistently dark from beginning to end, I think one game stands above the rest. Mario & Luigi Partners in Time. The story starts out in the dead of space on a barren planet where we see the shadow of an unknown creature. It turns out that we are looking at the past where the Mushroom Kingdom, along with our baby heroes, are under attack by an army of evil aliens, the Shroobs. Fast forward 20 something years to the present where Princess Peach, along with Todiko and Toadbird, is departing on a trip to the past thanks to the time machine created by Professor E. Gad. When they return, the time machine is destroyed and in it, an evil alien creature. Adult Mario and Luigi arrive on the scene where we figure out that Princess Peach is trapped in the past during an evil alien invasion with no way to return. Back in the present, the time machine is broken beyond repair. That's it, GG's. Luigi starts crying as the world starts shaking around the bros. The castle begins to terraform into ruins with the grave of the missing princess at its center. Okay. I made that part up, but imagine how crazy that would have been. If this was a single timeline time travel story and Peach getting stuck changed the future and the world was just fucked. No, we are dealing with the more family friendly multiverse theory here. Luckily, the disturbance in the timeline opened up a portal to the past that Luigi heroically jumps in first, followed by Mario to save the day. We learned that the Shroobs have pretty much taken over the entire kingdom already. Every town and city is in ruins, with almost no one to be found. The Shroobs have been inducting the Toads for who knows what. They easily defeat Mario and Luigi, but before their fate is sealed, the babies come and save the day. Everyone regroups at Bowser's Castle, where a new time portal opens, sending all four bros along with Baby Peach and a young Toadsworth to the present. The four bros now have a mission to go through all the newly opened time portals, defeat the Shroobs, rescue Princess Peach, and save the past from certain destruction. In their first outing to Vim Woods, the bros learn the true horror of the shrews. We catch up with Todiko, who tells us what happened to her and Princess Peach. They were all captured the moment they stepped foot in the past. Princess Peach was taken hostage while Todiko was captured by the trees. The trees trap unsuspecting toads whose life force is sucked out of them in the form of Vim. The Shroobs then use the Vim to power all their weapons and ships. Before Todigo can finish her story, she's turned into a Shroob Shroom. We can assume through all the trees that look oddly similar to petrified toads that all the inhabitants of the Mushroom Kingdom have already met a similar fate. Mario and Luigi invade the factory and stop the Vim production, but it's already too late. The damage has been done. All the toads we saw throughout the forest have been turned into Vim. This sets the tone for the rest of the game. While the Shroobs themselves may not be on screen 100% of the time, they have a looming presence throughout the game as we go in and out of the past. We see the path of destruction left behind by the Shroobs. We see Yoshi's Island destroyed, Yoshi's being eaten by a giant Shrewboid Yoshi Titan, 
and being dropped on a conveyor belt like livestock for slaughter. We see the only two survivors in the entire game hiding from the shrooms in an enemy infested tow town. We see the rest of our friends turned into shroob shrooms. Everything culminates in the final dungeon, an evil shrewboid version of Princess Peach's castle. It's overrun by shrooms and other enemies, and at the end sits Princess Shroob and the captured Princess Peach, waiting for the final battle to commence. Of course, the bros make their way to the top, defeat Princess Shroob, and save the past. But wait, the game drops a big twist on us at the very end. Princess Peach is holding the final shard of the Cobalt Star, the magical item that is responsible for all the ripples in the timeline. It was actually used to trap the true villain, Elder Princess Shroob, the stronger and more evil leader of the Shroob army. So when the final shard comes together with the rest of the Cobalt Star, Elder Princess Shroob is freed. She's strong enough to destroy the entire world on her own, and now Mario, Luigi, and their baby counterparts are the only ones that can stop her. After the most intense and difficult boss fight in the entire game, the bros save the past and everyone lives happily ever after. At least, that's what I'd like to say. While on the surface, the ending of the game is your standard happily ever after video game ending, there are a lot of questions left unanswered. After defeating the remnants of Princess Shroob, we learn that the Shroobs are actually weak to water. Water dissolves all the Shroob mushrooms that have taken over parts of the Mushroom Kingdom, and even returns our friends back to normal. But the game never makes mention of what happened to all the citizens of the Mushroom Kingdom. Toad Town was left in ruins with only two survivors. All the toads that were absorbed by the trees and turned into Vim didn't get a single mention. Water didn't bring everyone back, the damage was already done. It's very likely that Toadsworth and the babies are returning to a post-apocalyptic world after the, well, literal alien apocalypse. Of course, the devs never meant for kids to think about any of this, but I can't be the only person who noticed just how bad it gets, even on my first playthrough. There are even a few side stories slash easter eggs both in this game and the sequel games that add more hints of darkness, such as the downfall of Fawful, who we all know is the villain of Bowser's Inside Story. And probably the scariest and darkest easter egg in the entire series, the return of the shrooms in Bowser's Inside Story. It turns out that after the events of Partners in Time, the shrooms were never actually destroyed. Bowser has them. The shroob army, Princess Shroob, and Elder Princess Shroob, cryogenically frozen in his castle vault. If they escape their imprisonment, they have the potential to once again take over the Mushroom Kingdom, and this time, it'll only be Mario and Luigi, no babies to help out. I don't know if the rematch will go in favor of the good guys this time, and that is dark. So we've covered the darkness theme for a lot of this video, but now I want to talk about the gameplay for a bit. Partners in Time introduces not only a third, but also a fourth button for combat with the babies. Baby Mario and Luigi add so much depth to the combat while not making it overly complex. Even though you have to keep track of four different characters slash buttons during combat, it's not overwhelming since each baby slash top button is paired with their respective bro slash bottom button. This makes for a more unique and entertaining new combat system while still staying true to the Mario and Luigi roots. One thing that is missing from combat, however, is touchscreen controls. In later games in the series, the touchscreen plays an important part of combat, but there's only a single use of the touchscreen in this entire game. It's actually surprising that touch controls are almost non-existent though. This game was released pretty early on in the DS's lifespan, and a lot of games on the DS, and later Nintendo consoles in general, are notorious for focusing too heavily on new console gimmicks. For Partners in Time, I don't think we actually missed out on anything by not having touch controls, especially with how fast-paced combat is with the four buttons and increased amount of bros attacks already. Speaking of bros attacks, Partners in Time both introduced the blueprint for bros attacks in every other game in the series, and introduced a unique system for those bros attacks that was never seen again. There are no longer three or four bros attacks with different advanced upgrades. Now there are 10 bros attacks that can be shared between each bro. What's unique to Partners in Time 
is that bros attacks are technically not bros attacks, but instead bros items. Yes, they are items that you can actually stock up on in shops. There are no more bros points either. The use of bros items are solely based on how many items you have in your inventory. Some people dislike this. I don't really know what the reasoning is for. But for me, attacks are attacks. They're all fun and useful. Uh, not that one. Probably the objective best set in the series. You do have to avoid breaking your thumb smashing for the flower items though. The last thing I want to talk about for this video is something that probably everyone that's ever played this agrees with at least a little bit. This game is hard as f- Hardness in Time introduces the Enrage function to boss battles. Once you do enough damage to bosses, they get an extreme boost in difficulty. Every boss begins to attack multiple times per turn, and some even unlock new attacks. It's very likely that you'll get stun locked in this game at least once during your playthrough. You'll accidentally miss one too many dodges and have to spend your next turn healing, but in order to continue dealing damage, you'll have to endure an onslaught of 3, 4, 5 attacks before getting your next turn. This happened to me a couple of times, so I really had to focus on doing massive damage on the turns I could act. Luckily, the game has no shortage of damage options, with all of its stat debuffing and infinite slash green nuke attacks. No matter what you do though, you will definitely still have trouble on the final boss. Elder Princess Shrub is on another level. It's like she starts off in the enraged state, and has three more enraged states after that. She is the most difficult boss in the entire Mario & Luigi series, and she's up there as one of the hardest bosses in the entire Super Mario franchise too. What's even worse is that if you're playing the game on the American release, all the bosses, including Elder Princess Shrew, have double HP. Do yourself a favor and play the European or Japanese release if you can. If anyone wants to see something crazy, check out the speedrun of this game. These guys fight all the bosses at super low level while only having one or two hits of leeway on each fight. But for the average humans like you and me, we'll just have to make sure we're stocked up on 99 1-ups. Parties in Time doesn't get nearly as much praise as it deserves, especially when compared to the other games in the original Mario & Luigi trilogy. While some things introduced in the game might be seen as difficult to get used to, I think once you do get used to these things, the game shines. I vibe with the story and gameplay a lot. So much so, that I would rank this game at the top of all the Mario & Luigi games I've reviewed so far. This game randomly missed out on the 3DS remake treatment, so I hope more people pick up the original and give this game a try, because it truly is an underrated classic. That being said, thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.